Well, uh, let me thank all of you very much for taking the time to be here, and it's great to see uh, a wonderful turnout uh, to all the mayors. Uh, obviously, uh, I know how all of us are working overtime and the uncertainty, the backdrop of uh, our budget challenges and, uh, and the deadlines that are looming. So it's uh, particularly, I'm particularly thankful for all of you to take the time to come here. Uh, to all the representatives, school districts, school boards, superintendents, including our own, uh, Carlos Garcia, um, we understand that similarly the struggles and challenges and travails and uh, uh, issues uh, that you're facing. So it also means a great deal. So the backdrop uh, is self-evident, uh, but nonetheless, uh, this is, I think, also an opportunistic time to have the pleasure uh, of our new Secretary of Education, uh, who has traveled uh, late last night into our city and is going to be spending a good part of the day touring schools. Uh, we already met with representatives uh, from uh, the Schwarzenegger administration uh, and just had the opportunity of a quick meeting and uh, we'll be uh, hopefully uh, spending a lot of time with you throughout the rest of the afternoon. Uh, my name is Gavin Newsom, uh, the mayor here in San Francisco. Uh, as many of you know, and I see a lot of familiar faces, we've been organizing these meetings for the last two years with Hydra Mendoza and others in my office as an opportunity to really begin a dialogue between mayors, city representatives, and school boards and superintendents. I think it's long overdue. Uh, we were stunned. We, uh, we had our first meeting a number of months back. Uh, and uh, we are a number of years back, and I was stunned that we actually had an opportunity not just to introduce ourselves to one another from other cities, but we actually had uh, superintendents and mayors that had never met uh, that were introducing themselves to one another, which was suggestive <laughs> that we uh, needed to be doing this sometime back, whatever it takes. Uh, but it's all about building relationships. Uh, we talk in San Francisco not just about public-private partnerships. We talk a lot about public-public partnerships. And I just want to kick off in that stead and in that light uh, just to thank uh, our superintendent of schools and our school board. We don't always agree, uh, but one thing we have done is reconciled those disagreements by recognition that we're all in this together and there's real interdependence. And we have a memorandum of understanding. We actually put a contract on the line and on the table uh, where we have formed a partnership. We call it a partnership for achievement, uh, but basically a partnership to say, look, we need to do more and do better to support our preschool and early childhood education efforts. We're, I think, the only city in the state that has comprehensive uh, preschool. We said we needed to put arts education back in the schools. Every child, every classroom, K through 12, has comprehensive arts education. The city's just fully funding it with our uh, arts master plan. We said we needed to put nurses and doctors back in the schools. So the good old days when you had a nurse and doctor, we, uh, we didn't have many of them. We, we decided to do wellness centers because we want to deal with physical as well as adolescent mental health issues and, and the city again fully funding. Now even fully funded this year, salad bars because we're so proud of our first lady, Obama, uh, Michelle, with the, the new garden out in front of uh, Washington, uh, right in front of the White House, and of course our, our own first lady, uh, Maria Shriver, doing the same. And uh, so we thought we would pick up on that spirit, uh, organic foods, healthy foods, and salad bars. And I think we got them all the most of the high schools, and we're getting some middle schools. And we've got a great uh, partnership, and we were just talking to the secretary, this partnership uh, with our uh, California State University system. Do this. They, they, if they're going to open up themselves to us, they should be doing the same for all of you. Uh, and that is an opportunity to provide a four-year college education for every sixth grader. We call it San Francisco Promise. So the whole frame in our city is not K through 12, it's pre-K to 16. Uh, and I think it's an important narrative. But again, it's all about partnerships and, uh, and principles that can advance real solutions and real reforms. Uh, but reform is upon us, and that's the opportunity to talk with the Secretary about those reforms coming from the federal government. Reforms with resources, and those are just the kind of reforms we're most open to, aren't we? Reforms that are funded. Uh, so I'm sure the Secretary will uh, look forward to uh, talking uh, about some of those ideas and his values and principles, which I think are rather extraordinary. Uh, so with that, uh, again, thank you all for being here, and I am turning it over. Glenn, am I turning it over to you? All right. Well, let's turn it over and thank you uh, again to West Ed for helping put this together. This has been uh, a wonderful, a wonderful process, and uh, I'm immeasurably grateful for all of your support and stewardship. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you've been a great champion, and as has Hydra, of this project. I don't think we could have launched it with, without your office, so thank you. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for taking time out of uh, your lives to be here, and welcome to Secretary Johnson. We appreciate you being here. 
We're really honored to have you here and to have you be part of the Mayor's Roundtable and have a conversation with you about how to make a better difference for kids in California. WestEd um, thinks of this roundtable as one of the most exciting things that we do. Um, and, and the reason for that is because of the promise it holds for sustainable, positive difference for kids. And I think you just heard it in, in your remarks about creating an infrastructure and collaboration that makes a difference for kids. For those of you who don't know us, position ourselves pretty squarely at the intersection of policy, practice, and research. Focused on creating solutions and acting on those all around our mission, which is one of equity and excellence in education and learning. And I think that's exactly where the roundtable is exactly in that spot. Um, it is based on a very strong belief, which again, I think you articulated well for an, an example of strong public and private and public partnerships can make a difference for kids. Um, not just in terms of leveraging resources, not just in terms of galvanizing public support, but I think what you see in this room is a way to break down the silos that keep our kids from getting the support they need to be successful in school and to be thriving in our communities. And just by having these meetings, those silos start to break down, and we've seen that. And to focus on dropouts in order to, to really make a difference for our kids. The other thing I think, and I hope you'll hear from, from this um, round table, is that it provides a collaborative space to listen to each other, to meet each other, I didn't have that down, but to meet each other, to listen to each other, to learn, and then to work collectively to lead, to make a difference for every kid in the state, not just the few kids, the kids who are lucky enough to benefit from San Francisco's programs. So we think this is a really innovative approach. We're glad you want to hear about it. Um, because I think these mayors, these superintendents, these school board members have taken a real risk to come together across sectors and focus on kid needs instead of adult needs um, and believe that communities will get better if our kids are served better. That's a risk for everyone. We think there are lessons <coughs> learned, and I hope we can share some, the good and the bad, um, and that perhaps you'll take this back. Um, and share it with mayors across the country because I think it's a model that could benefit many, many other communities and states. With that, I'm going to ask Paul Kohler, who's the director of um, the Roundtable for West End, to give you a very, very brief snapshot of what does collaboration really look like once you meet each other, and um, what did it mean for this group to focus on dropouts um, and, and try to tackle that collectively. Thanks, Glenn, and good morning, everybody, Secretary Mayor. Thank you for being here. And thank you, all of you, for changing schedules in order to accommodate this day. Really appreciate it. And um, I think in this room are many of the uh, municipal and school district leaders in California as I look around the room. Uh, these are people who are leading the efforts to improve education for kids in the state. And uh, West Ed and, and my work at West Ed, I'm proud to be part of the project and, and help lead this. So let me to say a little bit about what we do and why we do it. Um, when we started this about two years ago, as the mayor knows, our, our theory was that there's plenty of work to be done to improve education. And there's plenty for the mayors to help and certainly for the school districts to do it, school leaders. So there's plenty of work, and why don't we do that together? The other theory, which has proven, I think, to be true around the state, is that there's a place where the authority and responsibility of, this, of the city and the authority and responsibility of the school district come together. And that's what the round table does. It, it works in that place where the city and the district can do something better together than they can apart. And especially in a time of scarce resources, um, it, it, it's, it's incredibly important to do that kind of work. Um, I know that the secretary is, has one of his new initiatives, uh, helping align the work of the foundation, foundation of the United States with his initiatives. He might talk about that in the meeting. And I'm honored to be part of a work group helping him figure that out. And I'd be remiss this morning if I didn't introduce the president of the James Irvine Foundation, Jim Canellis, uh, whose, whose support has made the roundtable possible. And I think it's a California example, uh, 
Secretary of what you're trying to do nationally. So, Jim, would you don't mind just greet everyone? Sure. Very briefly, uh, Jim Canales with the James Irvine Foundation. And our foundation, which is California-based, has as one of its goals to increase the number of low-income students who graduate high school on time and achieve a post-secondary credential by age 25. And we saw the opportunity to support the Mayor's Roundtable as clearly one opportunity that leads us toward that end. And I simply want to applaud the Secretary's emphasis on looking for ways to really align the work of private philanthropy with the work of the public education sector in a way that really drives us towards shared interests that we have. We see this as a terrific example. Look forward to partnering with all of you as we already do as we continue this important work. And it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you, Mayor, for hosting us. Thanks, Jeff. So the work of the roundtable really is at three levels. Uh, one of the levels is, is what you see today. It's, it's bringing people together in a collaborative spirit to talk about our common problems, talk about our challenges, but talk about what we're doing that's helping to make a difference and learn cities and districts learning from each other. So it's at that level. Second level of our work is at the community, where, where the, the mayors or the districts reach out to us and we go in and try to help them bring the community together. And I'm looking down at Mayor Kevin Johnson in Sacramento, and March 10th was your, was your big community-wide summit. It was an amazing event. And, and we were happy at the roundtable, Kevin, to come in and help you with that. And, uh, but that's sort of that second level of work in the community. And our third level of work is providing resources so that we can all learn. Um, and that was a specific request from, from the mayor at the end of the December meeting that we come up with some way to share practices between cities and, and districts. And actually, we're developing a very innovative tool at West Ed that we're going to roll out pretty soon to do just that. So that's what our work is. Um, today is really a dialogue with the Secretary. Uh, that's really what it is. And, I, and I'll just suggest a couple of things that might be topics, and then, Secretary, you can take it where you want to. Uh, one probably is, is some discussion of where this administration is going, where the Secretary and the President are going with education in the next four years and hopefully eight years, where, where that, what that looks like. Uh, the second is probably some discussion with the, with the, the, the members of the roundtable about what it's like to work collaboratively between a mayor and a school, di school district, the challenges or barriers or opportunities and successes of that. And then the third that's on everyone's mind is, uh, what's going to happen with the stimulus money that comes out? Race to the top, innovation funds. Uh, I've had a few private conversations this morning with some of my colleagues. I said, should we bring that up? I said, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you should bring it up uh, because the secretary is going to bring it up. I thought that might be a topic. It's a topic. <laughs> so I think with that uh, set up, Secretary Duncan, uh, we'll take it from there. Thank you for being here. Th thanks for all of you for coming. Very, very brief. I'd love to have a conversation rather than lecture. Just again, thanks so much for all of you coming together. And I think this collaboration between, and so to state the obvious here, this collaboration between mayors and su school superintendents is absolutely critical. And I would argue a lot of the historical lack of performance in public schools is due to that lack of collaboration. And to the mayor's point where folks don't know each other, let alone aren't working hand in hand. Uh, when, when adults don't talk, when there's adult dysfunction, kids lose. And I think that's been far too common around the country. And I can tell you very clearly, I wouldn't begin to have the opportunity I have today had not Mayor Daly been an absolute partner from, from day one. And I owe so much to him and to the team. You guys know this, every issue that our society deals with, housing, jobs, public safety, parks, health and human services, they all intersect with the schools and school children. And if we aren't all on the same page, if we all aren't working together in the best interest of kids, we don't help them get where they need to go. And uh, these problems are so tough, so intractable, and I'm pretty convinced school systems, school systems by themselves can't, get, can't succeed. And you have to rally the entire city behind these efforts. All the sister agencies, the business community, the philanthropic community, the kind of partnerships you see here are just so fun to observe. And that only comes with leadership from the top. So I just really want to commend the mayors for, for uh, for stepping up, and um, it doesn't have to be mayoral control, but it's got to be collaboration, it's got to be partnership, it's got to be leadership, and mayors have to be thinking how they do everything they can to drive resources and create a climate where kids can learn. And I just think you cannot have a great city if you don't have a great school system. I think it's just ab ab absolutely impossible. And uh, some of these things are structured in interesting ways, and Kevin, how many school districts do you have? And, you have five, so I, not how I would draw it up, but that's that's, that's how it is. And uh, you, you take it, you take it, and, and work with. That was that was a new one for me. We said that that one that one uh, stunned me. But I think it's just so so important that you guys work together. The other thing I'll say 
is that part of the problem in public education has been the tremendous instability in the superintendent position. Mm -hmm. And uh, just so the superintendent's here, has anyone been in their current job 10 years? One? What, what school district? Alameda County. Super. Okay, super. <laughs> well, congratulations. I just think that is so important. And um, one of the things that bothered me when I left Chicago, I was there seven and a half years, I was the longest serving big city superintendent at that time. And that's absolutely crazy. And that we have this turnover every you know year, two, three years. Um, you would never run a business that way. You would never run anything that we're looking for long-term productivity and success with that constant instability and, and turnover. And part of the reason I think you have that is because mayors haven't been enough engaged and haven't partnered. So to see the mayor, what you're doing with Carlos, and I hope Carlos is here for the next, you know, eight, ten years. And when you have those kinds of partners, no pressure, but, uh, but when you get good people, you have to stay with them. You have to grow together. And uh, where that doesn't happen, you know, I, I think where we were in Chicago in the seventh year compared to the, the third year, our team was so much better, and you're starting to figure things out. That time flew by. That was my biggest regret was I, I didn't, wasn't able to do ten years. That was the one thing I desperately wanted to do. And so giving yourselves time to build those partnerships and grow and continue to, to improve every year where you have a new person in charge every second or third year is impossible. And again, it just perpetuates st status quo, perpetuates mediocrity. So at every level, these partnerships are hugely important, and I appreciate you guys coming together and working together as a state. I think it's just you know, so many lessons that, that you can learn together. I'll, I'll talk through quickly sort of the things that, that we're thinking about and then love to obviously open up to, to, your, to your questions. And um, this is a time, as you guys know, of real economic crisis in the country, and you guys who live in this in California are unfortunately probably more than most. I would argue it's a time of real educational crisis, and we have huge, huge challenges. And for all the progress in all the districts, I don't think there's a district in the country that feels they've really conquered the dropout problem. I don't think there's a district in the country that feels their dropout rate is high enough. I sure haven't found one yet. And so lots of progress, lots of momentum, but we have to keep getting better. And there's a great line Rahm Emanuel, the, the President's Chief of Staff, uses, never waste a good crisis. And it, it, you know, despite how tough things are financially, it's oftentimes a crisis where you sort of get the kind of breakthrough reforms that you need. And I think collectively we have to be smart enough and tough enough to use this time of educational and economic crisis to, to fundamentally break through. Um, we're lucky to be able to put you know, $100 billion into education. The President's leadership in Congress has been unbelievably supportive. We will, we will probably never see this kind of money in our lifetime again, and a huge amount in you know, stabilization, huge amount of competitive dollars. But as the mayor said, I'm convinced that if we just invest in the status quo, it's not, you know, we're not going to get where we need to go. Yes, we want to save hundreds of thousands of teachers, teachers' jobs, but if we don't push a very strong reform agenda, we're not going to educate our way to a better economy. And so we're pushing a very, very strong reform agenda. I'll quickly walk through that for you and, and then open it up. And this is sort of more at the national level, but has implications in each of your, in your, your districts and your cities and in the state as a whole. First of all, we, we are pushing very hard to really understand what the data tells us. And in far too many places in education, we guess about what works, and we guess about which programs are effective and what strategies, and we guess which teachers and which principals are making a difference. And obviously, the data doesn't tell the whole truth, but the data certainly doesn't lie. And so we're looking to push very hard to make sure we understand the link between teachers and student performance, to understand the link between teachers and their schools of education, so that we understand which schools of education are producing the teachers that are producing the children that are gaining the most. We want to understand what value-add principles are providing each year. And the only way to do this is to have comprehensive data systems that track students longitudinally over time. We don't lose track of them, but also tracks students back to teachers. And I know you have some real challenges in this state. We just had a pretty, pretty good conversation about that. But uh, to be very clear from my standpoint, this firewall between students and teachers is bad for children and bad for education. And so I'm really challenging the state to think very, very differently about that and think how we link teachers to students. And when we don't do that, I actually think we degrade the teaching profession. That we basically are saying that teachers are interchangeable. They're like widgets, and it doesn't matter. And every single one of us in this room knows that great teachers matter tremendously. Great teachers, great principals make an extraordinary difference in students' lives. And if we don't know who those are, I think that does a grave disservice to education. I think you have about 300,000 teachers in the state. I would argue, take the top 10%, 30,000 teachers in this state are among the best in the world. And I don't think anyone in this room has a clue who those 30,000 teachers are, and that's a problem. 
I also don't think people in this room know who the bottom 30,000 are who need to move out of the profession. And the only way you start to do this is to link teachers and students together and track students and teachers over time to see who's doing the best job there. Secondly, we're, we're, we're thinking a lot about common, college-ready, career-ready, internationally benchmarked standards. I think California's done some great work here and has some, some high standards. But at the end of the day, we think having 50 states setting their own standards has really led to a race to the bottom, a dumbing down of standards. As you guys know, if you look at the NAEP data, there isn't one state that has their NAEP scores uh, close to their, uh, their state scores. And you have many states where 85, 90 percent of kids are meeting the state standards and 10 or 15 are meeting uh, at, on the NAEP results. And so many places, uh, California not being one of them, luckily, but in many states, we're actually lying to children. And we want to get out of that business, and we want sets of states to come together to really think about how we create these college-ready, career-ready, internationally benchmarked standards so that our children can compete on a level playing field with children in India and China, which is where the competition is for jobs. And right now, we're not doing that. Uh, third is that talent matters tremendously in education. Great teachers, great principals matter tremendously. And in every tough inner city area and every rural area, you see schools and school districts beating the odds with high poverty, high minority populations, and those students are doing extraordinarily well. Our goal is to make that the norm, not the exception. And so really thinking about how we identify the best and brightest teachers and principals, how we encourage the best and brightest teachers and principals to take on the toughest of assignments. And we talk a lot about the achievement gap. I really see it more as an opportunity gap and a talent gap. And historically, there are very few incentives and lots of disincentives for the best teachers and best principals to go into the toughest of communities. So how do we fundamentally think about that differently? Third, we have areas of critical need, math and science, foreign language. I think we should pay math and science teachers more money. And again, you pick a number, five grand, 10 grand, 20 grand. I think we've had a shortage for a couple decades now. Um, I think it's you know, huge consequences for our children, huge consequences for our economy and our, our country's health. Um, it's hard for children to be passionate about math and science when they're taught by teachers who don't know math and science. It's hard to teach what you don't know. And so I think we need to be much more creative about that. So identifying talent, getting our best and various talent to the communities that have been underserved often for decades, and then where we have areas of critical need, thinking differently about that. And then finally, we can get into this later, there's a lot that uh, I think NCLB did right in the focus on the achievement gap and disaggregating data. I think it's hugely important, and forevermore in this country, we can't sweep under the rug the differences in performance between white children and African American Latino children, and we have to continue to challenge ourselves every day to close that gap. One of the things that I, I don't agree with is that many, many schools were labeled failures. And it's sort of what I would call a blunt instrument. And amongst those schools that were labeled failures, I think the stories are very complex. I think they're actually a set of schools that are actually getting better every year. In fact, they're doing extraordinarily hard work. And those are schools where you label them as failures, where I think it is dishonest, it is totally demoralizing. And we need to think differently about that. There are a set of schools that are struggling and getting better we need to really work on. But what I challenge us all to think about is those schools really at the bottom nationally. And uh, we have about 95,000 schools in the, in the country, rounded up to 100,000. I would argue if we took the bottom 1% of schools, and uh, I think you have about 10,000 schools in California, I'm not sure. So think about if you took the bottom 100 schools in California. But by any definition, you took dropout rates, test scores. I'm a big believer in looking at gain, not at absolute test scores, but where you see you know, dropout rates of 60 70%, where the gain is very, very low. If you took the bottom 100 schools in California that I would argue are what we call dropout factories, I would argue that they are part of creating poverty and creating social failure, I want us to think very, very differently about those schools and how we turn them around. That in many places we need more investment. We need to invest and continue to build. In some places more money is not the answer. We need a fresh start. And being, having the courage and the political will to come in and bring new teams of adults to work with schools that have struggled. And I would, if you look at your data, I would bet you that those schools that are in the bottom 100 of the state have probably been there for 10, 15, 20, 30 years. I wish these were problems that just emerged in the last year or two. <coughs> They've been there forever. And people have tried things, and they simply haven't worked. And so what's going on for children, I think, is really unfair. So thinking very, very differently about those struggling schools around the country. And can we, as a country, year after year after year, start to chip away at those and fundamentally turn them around? And if we were to get up to the point where we could take 1,000 schools a year over the next four, five, six years, we could basically eliminate the bottom 5% of our portfolio and come back with schools dramatically better. 
Um, this is some of the toughest work we did in Chicago. I would argue it's some of the most important. And we had children in these schools where we moved the adults out, moved in new teams of adults, same kids, same socioeconomic challenges, same families, same neighborhoods, same crimes and everything. Those children performed two to three times better, not two or three percent. Speaks everything about what adult expectations means. One of the schools we turned around that was one of the worst in the third year of the turnaround had the highest gain of any elementary school in the state, the greatest gain, bottom to the top. So again, talent matters, so thinking differently about that. So those four things, thinking about comprehensive data systems, internationally benchmarked standards, thinking about human capital and talent very differently, and really challenging ourselves on those bottom schools are going to be very, very important going forward. Race to the top, probably what people want to talk about. Uh, a lot of money, $5 billion there. And that's just the start, $5 billion there. We have another $5 billion in school improvement in Title I money. We have $500 million in the Teacher Incentive Fund. We're going to put, over the next couple of years, over $500 million into the Thomas neighborhoods trying to replicate the Harlem Children's Zone that's been so effective. We have $250 million for data systems. It's a long way of saying we have north of $10 billion in discretionary resources. Um, I, I heard Secretary Page had about $17 million. We have $10 billion. <laughs> so it is a huge, huge once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And what we want to do, to be very clear, is use unprecedented discretionary resources to drive the kind of fundamental change that we think schools and school districts and states need. That we want to drive the kind of change that will far outlast the dollars being spent, change that will change education in this country for the next couple of decades, not just for the next couple of years. And so we want to invest very heavily um, in states and in districts that are willing to challenge the status quo and lead the country where we need to go. And um, this is going to be, uh, it's interesting politically that by definition we're going to have a lot more losers than winners. <laughs> we're going to say no to a lot of, to more folks we're going to say yes to, so my, my popularity is going to go south pretty quick. Um, but what we want to do is work with a set of states, a set of districts, a set of nonprofits that are willing to lead the country where we need to go. And I'm convinced that there, that will and that courage is out there. And if we can get a relatively small number of states and districts to challenge the status quo and sort of push this package of the suite of reforms, not just one or two or cherry pick, but the combination of all those things, um, we want to invest hundreds of millions of dollars in states and districts around the country who are going to lead us where we need to go. I would argue we've had a bit of a race to the bottom. We're calling this a race to the top, and we want to fundamentally flip that on its head. And, uh, you know, I have huge hopes for what California can do. Um, California has some real challenges. You have huge economic challenges. I would argue that you're, for me, more importantly than your financial cha challenges is having the courage to do the right thing by children. And do you have the collective political will to challenge status quo that have hurt children for a long time? And I would argue that's the tougher battle for you guys collectively to figure out than the financial challenges. And so we want to help on the financial piece. We want to invest, again, un, you know, unprecedented amount of discretionary monies in folks that have the political courage and the will to do the right thing. And I would love, um, if I see that coming forward from, from you individually, collectively, districts and states, um, I would love for, to have California at the table. But um, California has some things it's got to change to, to get at the table. And um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that and uh, open it up for any questions. Again, just really appreciate the opportunity to have the dialogue and appreciate you taking the time to come together. Again. Yeah. I, you know, in San Jose and probably throughout California, we're looking at 50% of our teachers are over 50 years old. Yeah. Tremendous time of change. The baby boomers are starting to check out. And, you know, with the economy the way it is, way back in the day, 60s, early 70s, we had federal teacher corps. I went to federal teacher corps. Smart young people, kind of like Teach for America. Yeah. Do you have any plans to ramp that up? We got, uh, you know, we got credentials, we got master's degrees, we had a little bit of a stipend and a commitment to rural and area, high poverty areas. It's time again. Yeah. It's, it's a great point. Again, we talk about human capital matters anytime. It's a huge one. We got a, a million baby boomer generation, million from the baby boomer generation leaving the teacher ranks. It could be as many as a third of our teachers. Some real challenges. I would argue some huge, huge opportunities. And if we can recruit the best and brightest from around the country over the next four or five, six years and keep them in teaching, we're going to change public education for the next 
25, 30 years. This is a generational shift. So again, this is part of this sort of historic opportunity. And so there's a lot that we want to do around loan forgiveness in public service. One of the few benefits of a tough economy is teaching becomes a better teaching profession. But part of what I want to do starting this fall and uh, work with the, the President, the First Lady, who are just obviously unbelievable ambassadors and passion in this issue, the Vice President and his wife, Jill Biden, who's actually still teaching today, which is amazing. We want to get out and travel the country and try and get this next generation of 18, 19 year olds to come into teaching. I'm also a big fan of alternative certification and we really want to open the door for folks from other professions to get into teaching. And again, one of the benefits of a tough economy is you've got, you know, if you've got good scientists, good chemists being laid off, let's get them into our classrooms. And so our ability locally and nationally to say if you want to serve your country, just sort of call to service, you know, come teach, come be part of this. We have a huge, huge opportunity over the next couple of years, and we're starting to think through now a campaign that we want to begin this fall to literally travel the country and, and work very hard on that. My name is Chuck Weiss. I'm the Santa Clara County Superintendent of Schools, and I'm the president of the Association of California School Administrators. I want to thank you for being here in the Bay Area and speaking today. I also want to thank you for appointing uh, Assistant Secretary Thelma Melendez uh, for elementary and secondary education. We look forward to working with her. For those who don't know her, she's from Pomona Unified. And we'll do a great job for you. And also Martha Cantor from our Foothill De Anza School as your undersecretary. I'm getting in trouble for taking too for California. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, we think those are two great appointments. I agree. I want, to, I want to ask you a financial question. We've heard conflicting reports about uh, how many more cuts education in California can take and still qualify for ARRA funds. Uh, we're, we're going to be experiencing this 45 days cuts to the current fiscal year and then additional cuts to next year. So can you clarify for us whether we'll still be eligible here in California? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I don't have an answer. I don't know all the details. I'll just say that you know California is really important to us, and we want to find ways to partner. And uh, we're working closely with the governor and his staff to, to figure out how we help you through this. So we understand things are, are very very tough now, and um, we don't want to walk away from the table. So without getting the details, we want to be there, and we want to find ways to continue to support what's going on here. We want you to be our champion. Yeah. Michael Watkins, County my question is this, um, uh, we appreciate the money coming down from the feds to help support education here in California. My concern is that many districts may use those funds to basically supplant and not really look at reform. How can you hold them to the fire and be accountable for these dollars and they won't be wasted? Great, great question. And there's an inherent tension here. And we have two two goals that, that can be in conflict. One is we want to save hundreds of thousands of jobs. We think that's, we don't want to see class size go from 25 to 40. We don't want to see social workers and librarians and counselors laid off. At the same time, we have to push this very hard, this very tough reform agenda. And so we're trying to do, I'm sort of a big believer in carrots and sticks, sort of rewards and consequences. So as you know, we, we're putting out uh, billions of dollars in the first round of, of uh, stimulus funding, but we also withheld. <laughs> billions of dollars in stimulus funding. And if we see states or you know districts that are acting in bad faith, that are you know supplanting, that aren't you know living up to the spirit of what we want, we have the ability to withhold that second tranche of money. The second thing is, so that's the stick. The, the second thing is, is as I said, we have these unprecedented discretionary resources, literally north of ten billion dollars. And I promise you the first question on the race of top application is what did you do to push reform with the stimulus dollars? And if there isn't a good if there isn't a good answer there, folks literally might as well tell to tear up the application and not waste their time. And so this is a real test again of courage and will and creativity and ingenuity. And you're gonna have a set of folks that can't see past the crisis or use the crisis as an opportunity to, to backfill and to supplant, and they're basically gonna lose out for the next couple years. And you're going to see a set of folks that use the crisis to push reform and to push change and to innovate and do some things that would actually would have been tougher to do in a, in a better economic climate. And those are the districts and the states and nonprofits where we want to put unprecedented discretionary money in there. So real carrots, real sticks, but um, that will be the first, you know, the RFP doesn't exist, but I promise you, that will be the first question on the RFP is what did you do with these resources to challenge the status quo? Hi, Secretary Duncan. I'm Ashley Swearingen. I'm mayor of the city of Fresno, which is about three hours south of here, the fifth largest city in California, and um, am just so refreshed by your comments and your commitment to reform and seeing cities and schools work closely together. I'm joined by the superintendent of our schools, Fresno Unified School Superintendent Mike Hansen, and then uh, Larry Powell, Fresno County Office of Education Superintendent. All that to say, 
we hear you, we want the same changes, we want the same reform, and to a very great extent, our hands are tied by things that are at the state level. Um, and just as a follow-up to your comment about needing to see California make some serious changes before California comes to the table, will you have a chance while you're here to meet with some of those folks that are most instrumental in seeing those changes made? Uh, we did that this morning. And how did it go? <laughs> <laughs> you want to speak to it? Or? No, it was some of them in the back. <laughs> ask them. <laughs> ask, speak up. What you got? How did it go this morning? <laughs> <laughs> you say who you are also. Yeah, that would, that would help. Sorry. My name is Glenn Thomas, Secretary of Education, Ted Mitchell, President of the State Board of Education. We have the name of the Department of Education. Rick Miller, also the Department of Education. There you go, guys. And you want to take a crack at thoughts from this morning? So I think that the, um, <laughs> dive in, um, the same things that the Secretary said to you, he said to us this morning. And uh, clearly have uh, the, his comments um, have us clearly focused on the needs to work harder on this project that I know uh, seems like it's been a lifetime project for you on our data systems and making sure that the data systems that we have are not only good accountability tools but good tools to really build the kind of continuous improvement system that we've been after for years. We believe that we've. Uh, we've got a lot of the pieces in place and are hopeful that, that this uh, encouragement uh, can help us uh, go the final mile. Uh, in terms of uh, some of the other things, a uh, clear consensus around our table about the need, as we've done with many of you over the last several years, to focus on California's uh, lowest performing schools and to provide the kind of uh, rigorous assistance that, that is uh, needed to turn those schools around. So I think all in all, uh, a very uh, upbeat, positive, consensual meeting, and uh, we're looking forward to working with you to uh, put together a, a, a very uh, positive and powerful race to the top application. Mm -hmm. when, when California applied uh, for the stabilization monies, we signed on to all four assurances. Uh, we did that thoughtfully. It was across the state superintendent, president of the state board, uh, and the governor's office. The governor signed himself. So that's been the frame that we worked from right from the beginning that we're making a commitment in the state to improvements in all four of those areas, the areas that you're talking about. Let me just take one sec, because I think this is really, really important. It's a little bit hard to talk about. But I think adult dysfunction has been a huge part of the problem with children's learning at every level. So principal, principal teacher, teacher parent, school board superintendent, mayor superintendent, local to state. And for us to get different results for kids, we have to behave in very, very different ways and move outside our comfort zone. And let me be clear, I think the Department of Education has been part of the problem. And I always joke about this, when the Department of Education used to call me in Chicago, that wasn't a call I looked forward to. <laughs> I mean, that was about a compliance report, it was about an audit. And so we are fundamentally trying to change the business we're in. Can we move from being this big compliance-driven bureaucracy to the engine of innovation and scaling up what works and taking, you know, taking those best practices and sharing them? So it's easy to talk about. That's hard to do. But we are fundamentally every day trying to change how we behave. And we're going to be very self-critical and look in the mirror every morning and say, what are we doing to get there? But just as we're doing it, I'm going to push everyone, teachers and soups and unions and state versus local, that if you just say it's a state problem, that's not going to get us where we need to go. We all have to move outside our comfort zone and behave in different ways. And again, all I can do, I can't mandate it. I can try and bully pulpit it. But I'm simply going to invest unprecedented resources in those places that do that, in those places that continue to perpetuate these, these this sort of dysfunctional relationships are going to lose out. I just can't put it any more bluntly than that. And so how you guys collectively, as a state, as adults, as leaders who care about kids, think about how you move outside your comfort zones and push each other to behave in very different ways, that's the only way we're going to get there. And again, I see us as a big part of that problem, and I promise you we're trying to correct that every single day. Secretary Duncan, thank you for being here. We are listening. Thank you for convening this. Uh, Tony Thurman, I'm a school board member in West Contra Costa County, just across the bay. Um, thank you for the resources you're bringing. We do definitely need them. And I want to encourage you to spend as much time in California as possible. Um, <laughs> not just because of money, because what you talked about in terms of finding opportunity in crisis is, is critical. But I believe that our state is in such a panic mode right now, we're not seeing the trees from the forest. We're not seeing the opportunity. I'll give you an example. Uh, I've been serving on this school district since December. I can tell you that we've had 
maybe five conversations about our 40% dropout rate, maybe two conversations about achievement gap, uh, when 70% of our kids, 70% of our schools are in very low performance right now for kids of color. And the reason that that conversation hasn't taken place is because we've been completely distracted by what's happening from this financial situation in California. It has inhibited our ability, even though we keep saying we've got to do more, what we're getting back is, well, 45% of our budget in California is education. We need to have further cuts to all the layoffs that you already had. So but when I said if you would spend more time in California, it's because I'm interested in how you can provide technical assistance really to states to take the courage that you described, as opposed to just take the pill that's been offered to us to say, cut, 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 but yet we're saying kids are our priority. No, I appreciate that. I, this is, I think, my third or fourth trip here, and I'll, I'll try and keep coming back. It's also a big country I'm learning, so next thing. <laughs> 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 so, next week, I think I'm in Montana. Um, but, but I will tell you, again, just, you know, California means a great deal to us. And California has always led the country in many different ways. And I think California, frankly, in the sort of K-12 education has lost its way a little bit. And for better or worse, I think half my staff is from California. <laughs> so you have folks, Russell and Ali is here. You talked about Thelma. You got Martha Cantor coming on board. Mike Smith, many of you know. You sort of go right down the list. Tony Miller. Um, we have a whole crew uh, who are personally invested here. And so this won't be a place that gets forgotten. And we're just not in and out today. And we'll do whatever we can to be supportive, you know, again, based upon personal relationships, but based upon, I want California to lead the country where we need to go, and I don't want California on the sidelines. So we'll try and help. Thanks. Thank you, Secretary Duncan, for being here. Um, I, I picked up a value added in your comments, and uh, your, the previous administration was uh, primarily punitive in many ways, uh, and that hurt uh, the profession uh, and did not lead to reform in, uh, as, as it could. Could you comment a little bit more about how you see uh, Title I changing? 20% of our dollars in Title I are actually taken away from us in a punitive way to the schools that need it the very most and sometimes are making great progress, but because they started low, uh, they're, they are uh, penalized um, uh, with funds going to outside agencies and the federal government actually requiring us to transfer kids away from those schools that should, uh, should remain there. So th that's, a, that's a great question, broader conversation. I would argue that Title I is one of the places where money has not been spent as effectively, I think, across the country as, as we would like it. And there lots of money has followed poor kids. And I don't know collectively if we can show a whole heck of a lot of improvement there. Um, so uh, a couple thoughts. Um, I, you know, I, I like after-school tutoring. I think that's a piece of it. I think the idea of moving kids out of schools before you help them doesn't make sense. And so as we get into NCLB reauthorization, that's something clearly we're, we're going to look at. Um, we're looking at some waivers with the influx of resources on that 20% set aside to make sure those, those, those resources can go to districts. I would argue one of the most important things we can do, and I need to talk about this more, with Title I dollars is to buy more time for kids that our school day is too short, our school week is too short, our school year is too short. And you guys know for, for poor children, summers kill them. You know, six hours a day kills them. And so I would push hard with, and I'll get the numbers, you know, it's a huge influx, of, you know, basically a doubling of Title I dollars coming into the state. You know, can you bring kids back early this summer? Can you, you know, you know again, despite budget crises, despite all this other stuff, um, this idea of six hours a day, five, you know, five days a week, nine months a year, does not work for poor children. It doesn't work for kids that aren't going to camps and academic enrichment and visiting colleges over the summer. And we all know summer reading loss. We don't need another start study. We had kids to a certain point in June, and they come back in September, and they're further behind when they left. It's absolutely heartbreaking. And so um, I will look to be, to be flexible and, and to you know, create some opportunities there. But again, not just with new money, but with existing Title I dollars, I think we have to think very differently. And if you look at um, you know, high-performing charter schools and other things around the country, there's some innovative things going on around curriculum and technology, but it's fascinating to me. I think every single one, they're just spending more time. <laughs> and you know, It's nine hours a day rather than six hours a day. And if you have a good school and you're teaching, more time matters. It's too many sports analogy, but one team is practicing three days a week, another team is practicing five days a week. A team that's practicing five days a week is going to win most days. And so um, I want to partner, I want to be flexible as we get NCLB reauthorization, really look at some of that stuff. And I know she did some pilots at the end, some waivers, which was helpful on that. But 
the more we use Title I dollars, not as you know, jobs programs or not as whatever, but as getting more time for kids that are behind and need help, I think that's the best use of that money that we can, we can find. Yeah. Yes, thank you for being here, um, Secretary um, Duncan. Um, my name is Gail McLaughlin. I'm the mayor of the city of Richmond right across the bay. Um, I just I have a couple comments and a question. Um, first of all, it, it seems to me like the, the whole root cause of our educational problems lies in the, in the poverty and the economic inequity that we see throughout, throughout our, our society at large. And um, we want to, you know, in or, we have to look at that parallel as we look at how we're going to bring about a better edu education system because when you look at lower performing schools you know you know that there are so many out of school factors that that um, impact school success and there's a paper called poverty and potential out of school factors and school success by david c burling Berlinger, who um, talks about the various factors like low birth weight non-genetic prenatal influence inadequate health care environmental pollutants, family relations and stress, neighborhood characteristics that really influences school, um, school success. So um, it seems to me that uh, we, need to, we need to look at that and we need to not, uh, when schools are not performing, we should, not, we should be giving them more resources, even that 1% to 5% that you're talking about um, needs to, uh, to be given an, a new influx of resources rather you don't you know the idea of when a city has a lot of crime you don't fire the um, the police department and uh, start all over so to kind of get rid of the teachers re is not a, a solution to me it's to give the resources and to move from there and to provide to find out what those resource needs are from the rank and file teachers um, I think um, as a former teacher myself, you know, I think the, the need to challenge the status quo is something is, is really important, not only for us, but to teach the kids who are coming up as, as leaders. Because of the massive amounts of problems in our societies, we need them to critically think through them. So rather than, you know, put them into, uh, you know, fitting into whatever tracks we have for them. It often seems like the tracks we have for them are, you know, college track, military track, Walmart, Walmart track, or prison track. And, you know, we need to find these creative ways um, to address uh, a well-rounded education. And I think that goes beyond math and science, although certainly those are very important things. So I... Can you get the question? So my question, <laughs> I certainly will. I certainly will. Yeah, I appreciate your, your patience. So my question is... Um, how can we, um, how, how can teachers, community members contact you to give you a, a sense of, of their needs? And, um, and um, yeah, do you have a, a contact number for them? My email is arnie.duncan at ed.gov, and so I'd be happy to get any thoughts. Let me uh, tell you where I agree with you and where I disagree with you. I think it's really important that our schools be community centers. I talk about schools being open 12, 13, 14 hours a day and uh, feeding children, helping with GED, ESL for families, and family literacy nights, and the more schools become community centers, that is hugely, hugely important. And if children um, aren't fed, if they are scared, if they can't see the blackboard, if they're not healthy, it's hard to talk about calculus and going to college and AP biology. Having said that, there are schools in the toughest of communities in every city around the country where 95% of kids are graduating and going on, and there are schools, same resources, same problems, where 50% of kids are there. And I think we have not been honest enough with ourselves about the tremendous disparities and outcomes, tremendous differences in outcomes from children from identical backgrounds. And in many situations, more resources are desperately needed. Education is desperately underfunded. And we're thrilled to have $100 billion on the table, and I would love to have another $100 billion. We can't do enough. But I will challenge you that in every situation, more money is not the answer. And that in certain situations, in any business, in any industry, in education, and it's not to blame anyone that what's going on for children isn't working for whatever reason and that more of the same isn't going to make things better for those children, and that we have to have the courage to start fresh and start over. And I will tell you, you could go to, I could send you to two dozen schools in Chicago that had historically disastrous performance, and in those same buildings with those same children and families have dramatically better performance. And it's because... Chicago, so I do know 
the so it's, that, it's, that really but matter. adults matter tremendously. Great teachers, great principals matter tremendously. So I don't want to act like, again, if we act like every teacher is the same, every principal is the same, I think we do a grave disservice to the profession and to those that are making a huge difference. Good experienced Carl, teachers Carlos need more resources, yeah. so there's yeah. no question. Yeah, Carlos, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just have one question. I'm, not that I don't our, trust our state, okay? I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm um, but, you know, when, when you hear a governor or people talking about shortening the school year in a state like California, and where you see, you know, people forget that after Prop 13, you know, before Prop 13, we ranked fourth in the country in per pupil allocation, and 18 months after Prop 13, we were 44th in the country, and we've been there ever since. In fact, now we're even lower. But having said that, what, what I guess, hypothetically speaking, Arnie, um, and we've actually known each other for a while, I'm just curious, uh, what, what would we, uh, in a situation where maybe a state wouldn't carry out necessarily their responsibility in, in meeting the goals and expectations that you have set out, would you consider uh, places enlightened places such as San Francisco where you have a mayor in a city that actually gives us the rainy day fund to, for us to survive because the state doesn't? Um, and to, that really cares about its children. Would you consider considering uh, if the state doesn't is ineligible? Would you consider certain school districts that have proven that they can do this? Could they be independently eligible? Yeah, and I should be really clear on this. So the the, the race of top fund is five billion dollars. Four point three five billion of that is going to go to states, and so California will win or California will lose as a state. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it is. And, and let me explain uh, why on that piece of it. And I, I said, in some ways, you know, I, I come from arguably the most dysfunctional state in the country, Illinois. That the, you know, past governor's in jail, current governor's in jail. I said, I, I, going to jail, and this isn't funny, it's, it's tragic. Um, during my seven and a half years in Chicago Public Schools, I worked with nine different state superintendents, nine in seven years. But having said that, that I think ultimately for our country to get where we need to go, we need states to step up. We can work with 50 states. It's hard. You've got 15,000, X number of districts. That's hard. So $4.35 billion is going to go to states and to districts. We've carved out of that $650 million to go directly to districts and nonprofits. And so that, whether it's you know, San Francisco or you know, any other city in the country, um, that $650 million is specifically to go to districts and to nonprofits working with them. And all the other money, the teacher incentive fund money, $500 million reward actions, that can all come from districts and nonprofits. So there, there are huge pieces of this that can go directly to where the action is. But the $4.35 billion of Race to Top Fund, I'm going to work, and again, you pick a number, 6, 8, 10, 12, there's no magic number. I want to work with a set of states that are going to lead the country where we need to go. And I need, um, you know, this has got to be literally a race to the top. And I need a set of folks who are willing to challenge the status quo and get there. And again, for all of California's challenges, I understand mm -hmm. the skepticism. You know, I'm hopeful. <laughs> I would love to see California be one of those states that leads the country where it needs to go. You guys are going to sort of make history here, or you're going to watch history. And it really is a sort of a defining moment as a state. And um, I can't give you the answer, but the stakes have never been higher. And you are really, you're at a crossroads. You're at a fork in the road. And uh, collectively, you have to figure <laughs> out wh where you're going to go. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm Tony Medrano, a retired teacher from San Francisco Unified, a member of the school board of Contra, West Contra Costa County. A couple of questions for you. Do you have any reaction to the University of Stanford report on the failure of the exit exam, both to our state representatives and to you, sir, and also that the state has to place education as priority number one, not prisons? That's the key for one thing. That's what I tell my, my parents and, and my kids in our school district. We've got to reverse it. At one time, we were the priority in the state. When I was a high school student in the Central Valley of California, we're no longer that. But I'd like to hear your comments on the exit exam, which Stanford has says it's not working. Uh, we have 47% of our district are not Spanish-speaking students, much like the state proportion, which is 46 or 47. So I'd like your reaction to that. And also that we're 47th out of 50 says something about our state and our priorities and the famous prop 13 that gutted funding for schools yeah, thank so you I, I don't know the details on the x exam so i can't give you an informed opinion on that but we can we can look at that and, and let you know um on on the second on the second part i actually agree with you i think california used to lead the nation educationally 
And I think, honestly, California has lost its way. And I think the, the, the long-term consequences of that are, are, are very troubling. And again, take a crisis, take a moment where things are very, very tough as a state to think through what's important. And I said, you know, I said earlier, you can't have a great city without great schools. You can't have a great state. You're never going to bring in jobs. You're never going to sustain jobs unless you make this investment. Um, but I'll be clear, I think the investment has to come with this reform. It's got to be investment not in the status quo, investment in taking us to the next level. Let me uh, update for Sacramento County. You had a chance to meet briefly uh, back in Washington, and many of the things you've talked about were presented at uh, Kevin Johnson's Education Summit very eloquently. And I think what you're saying to us, I just want to feed this back to make sure everybody understands. I think you're saying to us, we've been nibbling around the edges on most of these things, but we haven't really done much in the way of not mincing words with teachers on student performance. And Russ Russlin taught us that alternative compensation approaches, more alternative training approaches, more tough-minded approaches to low-performing schools. And, and I share that view, that we have been tinkering around rather than doing all those things, adding time. But you're asking us to come together and pave the way through the state to do those things and tell you what we're going to do. And that what I'm asking for is for more courage than I've seen in the past. And I would argue not only have you been kneeling around the edges, in some places you've been going backwards, not forwards. And that, that hurts children. And so, yes, I'm asking folks to think in fundamentally different, different ways. And I know, I know how hard this is. I know how tough this ask is. But I just don't think we're going to get different results yeah, if we keep you. doing the same thing. And I have, the last thing I'll say is I have too many examples around the country of where schools that are 98% minority and 98% poverty, 95% of those kids are going to college. So I know what happens when we as adults give real opportunities. And so there are no more, you know, people, you know, I don't care, poor, ELL, whatever, where we have high expectations, we have extraordinarily talented, committed folks there, those kids achieve. And our goal is to take those pockets of excellence, those islands of excellence, and take them to scale to give every kid those opportunities. I guess I'll do these last two, and then we have to uh, open it up. Is that right? Yeah, I think the press is getting Sorry. answered. All right, go one, one, two, one, two, and then we'll stop. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, thinking outside the box, I'd like to just offer this suggestion. Uh, nothing against our State Department or our uh, administration, but in our state, we have a regional uh, county office organization that works closely as constitutional officers. So in that $4.3 billion, it might be something really outside the box to allocate those resources as an applicant from our county offices. Since we're at the ground working with our school district, it would really be outside the box and there's some different ways. Uh, as an LDA versus the state, so I'd just like to offer that as an alternative, which is really could be outside the box. Last word. I'm Sheila Jordan from Allegheny County. Thank you for coming to the Bay Area. Uh, we are uh, 18 school districts. We go very, very diverse. So we go from some of the lowest performing to some of the highest performing schools, from urban to ag. And one of the, for, for, right now, we have taken off in this last almost two years uh, the study of race and its impact on what, what's happening in the classroom to try and look deeply at that. Uh, and I'm one we are very interested and concerned about uh, both the, oppor the opportunities of uh, transforming NCLD um, because we agree that looking at disaggregated data and the, and the charge of NCLD has been great. On the other hand, its implementation does not always be great, and the high stakes testing is extremely narrow. We're looking at um, authentic and alternative assessment, and we're wondering if you're going to um, open the door to the inclusion of outside skills, the integration of arts, of civic engagement, of history and science. Um, and we're doing teacher action research. Uh, which engages teachers and students. And I just wanted to run that by you and see what you thought. Yeah, and I, I'm uh, literally trying to travel the country now to really listen and learn and talk to students and teachers about NCLB reauthorization. Obviously, I lived on the other side of the law for a long time, so I have my, strong, my own strong opinions. But these issues are, are huge and complex. I do, worry about, I do worry about a narrowing of the curriculum. I do worry that that hurts kids. Um, 
what I and, and again when we when we do move to reauthor, reauthorize, what we accomplish will be law for five, six, seven, eight years. This is not something you come back every year. So we really want to take our time, be very thoughtful, and try and get this right. So I'm more than open. You know, you have my email. I'm more than open to suggestions. And uh, we want to lay the groundwork. Let me be really clear. We're trying to lay the foundation with race at the top and these assurances directionally so you see where we're going. I mean, we want this to be, you know, help to be the basis of that. But we want to be very, very thoughtful in the approach and just really pragmatic. To me, this has got nothing to do with, you know, what worked about NCLB we want to keep, what doesn't work we want to change. It's just as simple as that. Um, I've said, you know, I think the name is toxic. I think we need a new name, you know. <laughs> and, um, but that's, that's a symbolic. That's just a rebranding. You know, what really matters is what's the substance of it. And so really being thoughtful about how we don't narrow the curriculum, how we really create well-rounded children, how we create children who can be successful, you know, again, college-ready, career-ready, that to me is the end of the day. Um, how we think a lot more about graduation rates and, you know, again, students dropping out today they don't have a chance. But if you have thoughts, ideas, you know, I would love to see them. And we're going to take some time to, you know, literally get out across the country and, and hear it. Yeah, that's a, yeah that would be absolutely fine. And again, again, we have a lot of staff from California who you might know, so you can feel free to reach out to folks uh, directly. Um, the, the last thing I'll say, and again, just really appreciate the collective thoughtfulness and, and passion and commitment here, is I just want folks, again, despite the crisis, maybe because of it, just to take a moment and sort of think about the magnitude of the opportunity that you will never have, and I'm a little biased, you'll never have a president like this president. You'll never have a first lady like this first lady. These are guys that weren't born with silver spoons in their mouth. These are guys who are leading our country because they worked really hard and got a great education, and they are passionate about that. We will never have $100 billion again to, to work with. We'll never have a Congress as supportive as we have today. And we have a chance to push these kind of fundamental reforms that it, we've got a window here. We've got the next two, three, four years. You hope for eight, but you can't bank on eight. And so we're trying to, you know, I don't want to be too optimistic or naive. You know, we're trying to change the world in a couple of years and change the world for the next couple of decades. And so the real question is, yes, around resources, but I think, again, a lot more around political will, political courage, and adults behaving differently together. And I would argue those are the tougher problems. And if we can all think about those challenges and how we, you know, stop, take a breath. And if we lose this moment, I think we lose another 20, 30 years. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced of that. And so I think we're all, I think very luckily, at this sort of, this, this fork in the road. And we're going to decide collectively which way we go. And so I just encourage all of us to think about making the most of this, you know, just extraordinary opportunity. If we do that, then we change education forever in this country. So th thank you for your thoughtfulness. Thanks for the hard work. Guys, Hank, any of you have questions? I have a question. Um, I'm going to say this is in the name of Leanne Melendez. Welcome. Um, one of the issues that uh, I think you, some of the things that you support are charter schools and also um, incentives for um, teachers. Um, and that's one of the things that the California Teachers Association have been uh, adamantly opposed. Um, do you think something like that would work here in California? Like Merrick I think you have great charter schools here in California. Let me be clear, I'm for good charter schools. This is not let a thousand flowers bloom. And so I think, just take a minute on that because we didn't talk about it. I think you need to have a very high barrier to entry. You need to pick the best of the best. This is not let anyone who sends submits an application. You need to be very rigorous about who you allow to educate children. That's a huge decision. Secondly, once you approve a charter, I think you have to give them real uh, autonomy. You have to free them from the bureaucracy. These are, by definition, education entrepreneurs. These are innovators and visionaries. But you have to tuple, couple that autonomy with real accountability. And I love charters, but I close three for academic failure in Chicago. And so where you have all those conditions, a rigorous bar, and then at the back end, ac uh, autonomy and accountability, I think you see very, you know, very strong performance around the country. Where you see a thousand flowers bloom and we don't see you know, real creativity, where you don't see real accountability, things don't work. And again, this is just non-ideological. We need more schools in our country that work for kids. <laughs> and we happen to have a set of charters that are doing pretty well by, by any measure. Uh, these are our children. These are our tax dollars. They're accountable to us. And uh, if it is working, we need to do more of it. If it is not working, we need to do less of it. Mayor Pate, I think in every profession, 
that I'm aware of, we reward excellence. And no one goes into teaching to make a million dollars. People go in because they have a great heart and want to make a difference. But to, to let a great principal know or a great teacher know that we value them, and we've measured it, and they're making a difference in students' lives, I think rewarding excellence is, is a piece of it. And this can be on an individual teacher basis. It can be school-wide. I'm a big believer in building teams and rewarding entire schools that are really driving student achievement. But I don't know why we're scared of rewarding excellence in education. That, that amazes me. We're not scared of that in any other profession. Mr. Secretary, I'm yes, acknowledging that a number of people in California have made a number of mistakes for decades in education. Uh, today, the schools are not suffering, are not only suffering from that, but also an economy that just seems to be imploded. I mean, the government is talking about billions and billions of dollars coming out of education. Uh, what are the odds that California will be seen as very special because you care about it so much and somehow you'll find money, extra money, special money to send here to augment? Well, I don't, we don't have a special little money. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I think these people here wouldn't care if you snuck into the Bureau of Ingrates. Yeah. Of the <laughs> well, I'm trying to stay out of jail. Yeah. <laughs> That's a starting point. Um, so, to be, so to be clear, that there isn't a special set of money for California for everyone else and what we want to do is be absolutely as generous as we can with the uh, sort of the formula based dollars and we want and we have not we want we have north of 10 billion dollars in discretionary resources and again on a competitive objective basis we're going to reward those states those districts those nonprofits that are doing a great great job and we're going to treat you know California we care a lot about but we're going to treat everybody fairly and evenly and uh, if California wants to play in that area, we would welcome that application. Secretary Duncan, a lot of um, schools, in order to address an increased safety for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender students, are including LGBT issues in their lesson plans. Do you support including, like mentioned, the same-sex couples in um, lesson plans? I think we have to create climates in which every child feels safe, and whether it's children from the LGBT community, whether it's other children, if children don't feel safe, they can't learn. And so the more we think about breaking down barriers and creating environments, not just in the classroom, but in the hallways and to and from school, where children can concentrate on algebra trig and AP physics and not worry about, am I going to make it? And if I'm worried about getting beat up, when I walk out of this class and walk down the hallway, I'm not listening to that teacher. I'm trying to survive. And so the more we think about that those children, but frankly all children, and again I started talking about these foundational needs, um, if children aren't safe they can't learn. It's as simple as that. And we need to make sure every child is in an environment where they feel safe and can therefore concentrate and put their mental energy where it needs to be, which is what's going on in the classroom. Um, when you're talking about uh, a college ready international standard, um, and you're talking about how American kids will not be able to compete with uh, kids in China and India. Can you tell me some of the advantages that American kids have compared to, to the kids in India or China? Some of the advantages yeah. we have? Uh, we have many advantages here. We have extraordinary teachers. We got the best university system in the world, and so you know, we have people who are passionate about education. Um, but I think as a country, and I think, I know as a country, we've lost our way educationally. We used to graduate the, the highest number of college graduates. We used to lead the world. We don't anymore. And the president's drawn a line in the sand and said by 2020 we want to have the highest percent of college graduates again. And uh, he thinks, he thinks I, and I'm, you know, obviously I'm convinced we have to educate our way to a better economy. And so I, I think our children can compete with anybody. I don't worry about that. I worry about leveling the playing field. And I think our children in many places now are at a competitive disadvantage. And I think that is fundamentally unfair to our children, and that's what we want to change. And one of those places, two places where, that, that, uh, where I think we're at a competitive disadvantage is one where we have dummied down standards, where our bar is too low, and secondly, we're simply not giving them enough time. There are many children in Indian China are going to school 25 30% more per year. Think about that accumulation of just more work, more time over 12, 13 years. That makes a difference. And so I don't worry about our children's creativity, their passion, their ingenuity, their ability to compete. I worry about leveling the playing field. And I think we as adults got to do some things differently. Sir, do you think that California is in worse shape than the rest of the country because of the size of our deficit and the size of our state? 
I don't know if it, you know, California's got some real challenges, so I don't want to rank it relative to other places. You know, I was in Detroit recently, and Detroit's got some pretty, pretty amazing challenges as well. Um, so yes, California's got some real challenges, and you know, we want to be a partner, we want to help, um, but we're going to challenge California, particularly on this reform agenda, to meet us halfway. Anyone else in the press? Well, we've got about five more minutes. We promised to get you all out in time, so I imagine there may be a few remaining questions. Mr. Secretary, I'm Bill Bogard from the city of Pasadena. Two-thirds of the youngsters in our public school system are eligible for free or free lunch. Yep. Uh, we've started to think in Pasadena and I think around the state about a role for a curriculum that is uh, well suited to youngsters who may not go on to a four-year college. Uh, your goals are set very high, and I'm inspired by all that you've offered to us today. The question is, is there a role for a curriculum adjustment at this point in history that says to youngsters, uh, if, you, if, if you don't go on to college, uh, you'll still be ready for work when you finish or, or finish high school and two, two more years in a community college? Yeah. I should be really clear this. What I've always said, and I, it's, I gotta be clear my language, I talk about college ready, career ready standards. And again, whether it's four year universities, whether it's two year community colleges, whether it's trade, vocational, technical training, I think a high school, obviously a high school dropout has no options, zero. A high school graduate has very few. Some form of higher education, whatever that might be. Um, I've, I brought in Martha Cantor, who many of you know to be sort of my number three. We've never had someone from the community college world at that level in the organization. I think community colleges have sort of been the stepchild in, in education, a hugely undervalued resource. And so I think making sure children at a minimum can graduate from high school, the president talked about at least one year of some form of higher education. You know, green jobs, tech jobs, healthcare jobs. You know, as long as we're training folks for real opportunities, we have a long way to go in that area, and we have to be creative. And to me, these are almost forced. It's, it's college and career ready. Again, people like to make, create these, these, to me, false dichotomies. I think you guys see the data. I think the average student today takes like six, seven, eight years to graduate from college. I mean, the average student isn't graduating for people are working and going part time and, you know, figuring out families. And, and so, um, to me, it's to say one or the other misses the boat is saying, let's make sure at a minimum you have a high school diploma that means something and that you are prepared to take that next step, whatever it might be. And maybe you go work for a couple years and you go back to college full time three years after that. But the, my, my, the problem is we have too many children today who aren't prepared for either, who aren't prepared for higher education, they're not prepared to go into the world of work. And we've got to work on both sides. All those kind of things. Uh, I'm looking at an interview you did, uh, Mr. Secretary, with Time Magazine, in which they ask you a lot of uh, fun questions. Somebody say something dumb. So. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, it wasn't dumb at all. The question I have for you: You commented as much as you did today about charter schools, and you said, for instance, you need to have those charter operations have great autonomy to free them from the education bureaucracy, which I think we believe in. What would you think about a district, not Chicago, but one our size, say 44,000, becoming a charter district? Look at New Orleans. Look at New Orleans. Uh, maybe there's money available? We, uh, I didn't special talk money. No, I, we got, I didn't talk about it. We got a couple hundred million for charters. So we have, we have a couple... Well, I, you know, <laughs> um, we, we want to expand high-performing charter schools, so yes, you, we can look, you know, we, we'll, we'll, we'll follow up on that, but um, I think that's part of the answer. The, the last thing I'll please, yeah, okay, just, first of all, I just want to, if, please give the, the mayor a round of applause just for bringing us all together. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you. And just, the last thing to say, and I said it in a small meetings, it's just really important to me, is that, you know, we're not going to begin to have all the answers in Washington. <laughs> And, you know, when I was in Chicago, I didn't think Washington had all the answers. Now that I'm in Washington, I know we don't have all the answers, you know. And so this has got to be a real partnership. And we're going to do some things that make sense, and we're going to make some mistakes. And the more you guys, you know, are challenging me and challenging our team to think differently and to, you know, we're all in this together. We're all motivated by the same things. And so don't hesitate to, to push us. And we just want to be a good partner. And, again, we're trying very hard to change what we're doing. We're pushing you very hard to change as well. But the only way we're going to get where we need to go is if we continue to collaborate, continue to talk. And, uh, and push each other. And so please don't ever hesitate to, if something doesn't make sense or doesn't, doesn't feel right, give us a holler and, and, and ask us what we're thinking about. And if we're wrong, we'll change on a dime and go in a different direction. But just really want to start, this is the start of a dialogue, start of a conversation, not the end of one. Thank you so much. Thank you.
those of you in the roundtable group that are going on to the luncheon, did you see the secretary? SFG TV, San Francisco Government Television.